have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, and it's kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things and endures all things. Love never fails. As we gather around the tr throne of grace and thank God for another day and a chance to get things right, let us remember the season. This is a time of the year when we as Bahamians come together as a people to celebrate. When we, when we not only celebrate our independence as a nation, but when we celebrate each other and each other's accomplishments and achievements as Bahamians and as a people of the Commonwealth that is the Bahamas. And despite our differences, let us recognize that there is so much more that is in us that we have in common that brings us together and that binds us together. And one of these things is inherent in each and every one of us, and that is love. Today, we have all come through many hard trials, but we are still here. And we have each other, and we need each other. So I ask, as we move towards the throne of grace, that we get back to who we are as Bahamians, people of love. And that we show this, not, this understanding, not just in our words, but in our actions towards each other, as we repeat the Lord's Prayer. Come on, Allah, 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 First of all, thank the member for Port Charlotte, who, in my estimation, has been doing an exceptional job during this time of the year, 
with uh, independent celebrations. I want to thank him for bringing to our attention this morning the most important word that God has given us. As a matter of fact, God described himself as love. God is love. And that is the foundation that we all should build on, upon. Thank you, Honorable Member, for, for Charlotte. Our honorable members, before we proceed, I have a number of reports from the Auditor General that I wish to table at this time. Uh, the first report being an audit report on the examination of the Office of the Judiciary Magistrates Court for the period July 1st, 2016 to December 31st, 2019. Order that the document do lie on the table. The second document is an audit report, operations review report of the Bahamas Department of Correctional Services for the period July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2019. Order that the document will now lie on the table. A report of the audit review of the post office San Salvador for the period July 2018 to January 2020. An audit report for San Salvador and Ramkey districts for the period July 2018 to January 2020. And the final um, report, a special report, fire at the administrator's complex, San Salvador, dated January 17th, 17th 2020. In introduction and swearing in of new members, laying of documents by ministers, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of now a copy of the following. The Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Amendments Order 2020. Order that the document be brought up. Order that the document will lie on the table further laying of documents by ministers. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Bamboo Town. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of a house a copy of the following, and I wish to read it into the record. On behalf of the Senate. And, yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, it's a letter addressed uh, to the leader of government business in the Senate from the clerk of the House. <clears throat> the letter reads, Dear Senator Bethel, sometime after the meeting in the Senate on February, July 3rd, 2020, I received an inquiry from the opposition leader in the Senate as to whether or not the proclamation and its associated documents had been tabled by the Attorney General. I replied that according to my recollection, they had not been tabled. I have now had the opportunity to review my files of the documents bearing the signature of the Attorney General dated July 3rd, 2020, as well as the film and audio footage of the meeting of July 3rd, 2020, in response to the Governor General's proclamation summoning the Senate. I am now satisfied that the proclamation of emergency by the Governor General dated June 29th, 2020, and the emergency powers COVID-19 pandemic regulations 2020, signed by the Governor General, were properly tabled by the Attorney General on July 3rd, 2020, as required by the Constitution and law. My files, along with the minutes of the meeting, 
the film and audio footage are the true and correct record of the Senate. Yours truly, David L. Forbes, Clerk of the Parliament. I now uh, table Mr. How did the document be brought up? Ordered that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to lay on the table of the House a copy of the following. The Environmental Protection Control of pa Plastic Pollutions Regulations 2020 on behalf of the Minister for the Environment. I order that the document be brought up. <coughs> order that the document do lie on the table. Further laying of documents by ministers. Mr. Speaker, there are no further laying of documents. Statements and communications by ministers. The chair recognizes the honorable member for South Beach. May it please the honorable speaker. Rise in the name of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and wish that your leave, sir, to extend to all of our beloved brothers and sisters of the Bahama land a blessed anniversary on our National Natal Day of some 47 years. And I send a special celebratory greeting to our beloved family in the South Beach constituency. Honorable sir, I wish today to clarify for the benefit of this honorable house and the Bahamian people, the financial status of the University of the Bahamas that has been the subject of some media reports with regard to a reduction in its budget. I wish to state, sir, that the overall support of the University of the Bahamas has increased some $10 million since coming to office in 2017 and that the number of students, mostly full-time students attending that university has increased. And let me prove it, sir. The budget year 2018-19, UB received a total of $38,559,074. At that time, it serviced approximately 4,800 students. 2019-20, it received a budget of $30,744,000 thousand dollars for his operational support. Additionally, it received seventeen million dollars as a scholarship grant for eligible and qualified university students. In this budget year, 2021, UB will again receive the same amount last budget year, thirty million seven hundred and seventy four thousand dollars and will have an increase of $1.5 million for its tuition grant support for a total of $18.5 million, bringing the overall total to some $49.2 million, some $11 million higher than its highest peak in its history. I can stop here, Mr. Speaker, but let me continue. Like every Bahamian government department and every other household and institution and government on this planet, adjustments had to be made because of the new realities that confront humanity. However, these global adjustments, certainly in our particular circumstance, largely spared the most essential services in this country the education and training of our people, young and old alike. That is why additional sums are being expended to pay those administering the upcoming national exams, which begin July 13, five days from now. That is why sums have been increased at BTVI to expand its capability and its technical 
offerings for now nearly 6,000 Bahamian students. That's a place to clap. That is why. That is why $11 million this year, twice the budgeted amount last year, is targeted to conclude the digitization process of the educational system in the Bahamas. The first product of which was the prescient launch last September of the Caribbean's first virtual school. It's another place to clap. <laughs> prescient, sir, from the Latin root word prescire, means to come to know beforehand. My beloved Cat Island, honorable member knows Latin also well. We were both studying it concurrently at the same time. Because were it not for that school, sir, tens of thousands of Bahamian students would have been without educational instruction following Hurricane Dorian, and most particularly during this pre, uh, present COVID experience. Tens of thousands. In spite of these unforeseen challenges, this government continued to invest in the young and not-so-young minds of this country. May I also inform this Honorable House that in 2016-17, a budget total of $30 million was earmarked by the former administration for the then COB slash UB. Today, stated earlier, Mr. Speaker, the total receipt from the Bahamian people for the Bahamian people through the University of the Bahamas is $49.2 million. <laughs> May I advise, sir, that this year, for the first time in its history, in its history the University of the Bahamas, because of circumstances that now circulate across the globe, in particular the United States of America, where a number of our Bahamian students, to the totaling the uh, hundreds, would have previously gone for the extension of their educational experience. And many of whom who are now uh, refusing to go back because of the pandemic search circumstances in the United States. It is anticipated, according to the official at the University of the Bahamas, that the enrollment in the university this fall will exceed 6,000 students. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for the record, in the fall of 15, 2015, it was 4,800 students. 16, it dropped to 4,500 students. 17, it increased to 4,669 students. 18, 4,400 students. Last year, 4,671 students. And it is anticipated that this year, 6,072 students will be enrolled at the University of the Bahamas. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, further statements and communications by ministers. Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just, oh, I'm making some changes and taking um, off my shoes. So I um, Honorable it. Member, just a moment. Uh, order that the document be brought up from the Minister of Education, the Honorable Member for South Beach. Order that the document do lie on table. 
The chair now recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this past Sunday, I was pleased to witness the signing of the Hippocratic Oath by new physicians here at home who will serve our country for many, many years to come. The ceremony, Mr. Speaker, was special to me as a father because one of my sons took the oath which medical doctors have sworn for centuries. So, as a father, I want to publicly congratulate him. He don't like me to call his name, so I won't call his name. He's very <laughs> humble and low-keyed. <laughs> the Hippocratic Oath is an ethical oath historically taken by physicians. And it is a rite of passage for new medical doctors, Mr. Speaker. The oath is attributed to an ancient Greek physician and has various versions. One part of the oath, which I wish to paraphrase, is as follows. I quote, I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that I repeat that, because as I speak, individuals will understand why the Hippocratic Oath that physicians take and the practice of medicine is so important. Taking a quote from such oath, being paraphrased, I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. This has been a guiding light for me, Mr. Speaker, and the people's government during the COVID-19 pandemic. And because of this oath, and because of the oath of office I took to serve the Bahamian people, my first and most solemn obligation as Prime Minister, as Minister of Health, and as a medical doctor, is to protect and to save lives. While others may play partisan political games, my focus is on saving lives. Because of our tough, tough actions and decisions, we have prevented many Bahamians and residents from catching COVID-19 and getting sick and subsequently demising or dying. We have arrested community spread, but such community spread can quickly re-emerge if we don't continue to act decisively and strategically. And just because we have no new, well, Mr. Speaker, I should change that. But just because we had not seen any new confirmed cases for a while, it does not mean that COVID has gone away from the Bahamas. The spread and containment of this virus is in all of our hands, Mr. Speaker. It's not my hand. But each and every individual in the Bahamas has a responsibility. Each must be disciplined and each must be responsible. As any degree of irresponsibility can have serious consequences. We must be individually and socially responsible. And this is why I have continued to stress that if necessary, the government will reimpose various restrictions if warranted. We had stopped the spread of COVID-19. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to repeat. I want them to listen carefully to the adjective or verb that I use. We had stopped the spread of COVID-19. But the virus has not been eliminated and may spread widely and quickly again based on our individual and collective behavior. Mr. Speaker, today we are debating a resolution to extend certain emergency orders to protect the health of the Bahamian people. I quote directly from the resolution before the House of Assembly. And whereas, having regard to the continuing proliferation of confirmed cases in neighboring jurisdictions and active cases in the Bahamas, and whereas, due to economic necessity, the Bahamas reopened the national economy, including the entry of visitors coming from places in which there may be extensive community spread of COVID-19, which poses great risk to the public health of the Bahamas. And whereas the state of public emergency in the Bahamas continues, and whereas it continues to be necessary and expedient for securing the public safety, the defense of the Bahamas, the maintenance of public order, the suppression of mutiny, rebellion, and riot, and for maintaining supplies and services essential to the life and well-being of the community, to continue and enforce the proclamation, Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic, Regulations 2020, Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Order 2020, and Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Special Provisions Order 2020. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this House A approves the continuance of the proclamation made on the 29th day of June 2020 until the 21st day of July 2020, and B, affirms the continuance in effect of the Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Regulations 2020 made on the 29th day of June 2020 until the 31st day of July 2020, and C, affirms the continuance in effect of the Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Order 2020, made on the 30th day of June 2020 until the 31st day of July 2020. And D affirms the continuance in effect of the Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Special Provisions Order 2020, made on the 30th day of June 2020 until the 31st day of July 2020. Mr. Speaker, I wish at this time to advise the House of the most recent information from health officials as of today, July the 8th, 2020. The total number of confirmed cases in the Bahamas stood up to yesterday at 104, and it has now moved to 106. Two additional cases was confirmed in Grand Bahama this morning, and one case is equivocal and waiting for confirmation at this particular time. Grand Bahama. So, Mr. Speaker, thus far, there's been two new reported cases since the 14th of June, that's in Grand Bahama. And health officials will release details in their regular update. I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that health officials 
at this time are in Grand Bahama doing their surveillance and at the same time are investigating any forms of contact or possible spread, Mr. Speaker. 82 of the total number of cases originated in New Providence. In Grand Bahama, as of today, 10 originated in Grand Bahama. And our team is aggressively on the ground doing their contact surveillance, ensuring any type of travel, be those individuals, be any contact may have traveled just within Grand Bahama or to Nassau, Paradise Island, Atoll Island, what other that island that the key they like was women? Rose. Rose Island. Rose Island. <laughs> Rose, I was even speaking, my dad used to swim in Big Pond in the ditch. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but does. You know, it's amazing. It's amazing. I can just describe. Yeah, he knows. Jeff knows. The member for, for South Beach knows. It's amazing. As a little boy, we used to swim in the ditch. That's where we learned to swim. And then, as we improved, we used to walk the long walk and swim long walk. But in the ditch, there was always a coat of some element on the water. We just thought it was oil, and we just used to brush it aside. And as I grew older today and understand the environment, I know Jeff realized that we were swimming in the element, the... No, 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 no. We were swimming in the, um, the oil, the discarded oil from BPL, BEC, at that time. Yes. That's where they dumped the discarded oil in the ditch. That was the ditch. You wouldn't understand. But we didn't know at that time. So we swam in that, and we just used to brush it aside. So, Mr. Speaker, so I must have great resistance. Both the member for South Beach and I have been swimming, I've been learned to swim in petroleum infested waters. <laughs> oil infested waters but now as I grew I understood that I was swimming among a, a serious contaminated um, pool but 10 in Grand Bahama 3 in Bimini and 1 in Cat Key there are 89 recovered cases 4 active cases and 11 COVID-19 related deaths currently there are no hospitalized cases and a total of 2,467 tests have been completed. Mr. Speaker, more than half a million people have died thus far during the COVID-19 pandemic, and the death toll continues to rise even among our young people. And as I progress in what I have to say today, I will send a special message out to the young people. So those young people who are not yet listening to me, I would advise them to send messages out to all you can find so that I would send the relevant message to them so that they would understand the possible risk that they take should they become infected. Some medical experts, Mr. Speaker, are wondering about the long-term effects of this deadly and dangerous virus, which is very contagious. The virus is spreading at an alarming rate in various parts of our Western Hemisphere, including in neighboring countries. And I again warn Bahamians that the pandemic is not yet over. The global health emergency will likely not end until a vaccine is discovered. <laughs> Countries and territories 
are trying to navigate between opening up to allow people to make a living to take care of themselves while at the same time keeping in place certain restrictions to slow the spread of the virus. This is an ongoing balancing act requiring agility and quick action based on the best available information at the time from public health experts. We are trying, Mr. Speaker, to do two critical things at the same time. We're trying to protect lives and livelihoods. And we have to do both at the same time. It is not either or, it is both. And we strike that balance, that balance of the economy, that balance of life. And the members who are familiar with finance would know very well that we import a lot of our food, our oils, etc., which require foreign reserves. And if we're locked down and nothing coming in, our foreign reserves would become compromised at some point in time. And our dollar remains stable on parity with the U.S. based on one component our foreign reserves, which means if our foreign reserves be locked down, and our foreign reserves continue to deteriorate, our parity is compromised, and Bahamians won't be able to visit the U.S. or others because the dollar won't weigh anything. So one has to strike that balance. Then if you open too soon, then you run into the problem that other countries are experiencing now you must now lock down. So, Mr. Speaker, you understand the complexity that one experienced. It's new frontier. When Columbus sailed and others sailed, they thought they were going to fall over the cliff. They didn't know the world was round. We don't know what to expect tomorrow. But we do know that each and every country is observing and monitoring the others. And what works here, we try. But everything remains fluid. We don't know the solution. Nobody knows. Places that opened too fast, Mr. Speaker, and that did not follow proper public health guidance are experiencing a resurgence of the virus. And we see it throughout the world. Some healthcare systems are on the verge of collapse. This is something we have prevented thus far in the Bahamas. In some countries and states within some countries, the resurgence has been extraordinary. This has caused the imposition of restrictions, including lockdowns and the closure of establishments which were allowed to open Speaker, I listened the other day. When we opened our restaurants, we started with 50%. We allowed 50% occupancy. Some countries started at 75. They are now reducing to 50. But maybe 50 was the magic word. We didn't know. But they are reducing to 50%. Bars and other facilities that were open are being locked down. So they are turning back the clock, Mr. Speaker. The Bahamas has been a model nation so far in our handling of the pandemic. Because we locked down early and are now trying to gradually reopen. We are being widely praised internationally News which has apparently not reached some quarters, including the opposition, which seems to be deaf and blind to any news that does not suit their agenda. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the government took the crisis seriously from the beginning. We imposed restrictions early and moved to closures. Physical distancing, masks, curfew, and lockdowns. 
though these quick measures were criticized by some, together we stopped the virus in the Bahamas during the first wave. And during this pandemic, we have not made decisions in order to ponder and to posture for the personal political gain. We want our people, Mr. Speaker, to live. I made a statement when we were really in the pandemic. I made a statement, not as Minister of Health at that time, I made a statement at one of the Ministry of Health's press conference, and I said, yes, the Bahamian people want to live. And I said very dramatically that I too want to live. We all want to live, Mr. Speaker, but we all have a responsibility. And we must all do our part. One individual goes viral. He or she can com contaminate and infect thousands within our society and cause a meltdown of our society. So each individual is just as important as the other. And each individual, each individual must remain disciplined. You speak, I understand businesses and whatever. And you know, I was saying to one of my friends this morning while exercising at 5.15. We did not go out during the curfew, 5.15. <laughs> I said to him, boy, I would not want to be in business at this time. You had to bring in all sorts of computer systems and digital systems to deal with that. The reporting systems and mechanism. Then you have to deal with COVID. You have staff and other things to deal with. I said, business must be extremely stressful. <clears throat> My one saving grace is I am no longer in business. I am now on cruise control. Mm -hmm. Everything I have will be given to others. Allow me just to continue to cruise to the twilight of my years and look for my retirement home and just comfort. Right, Travis? <laughs> Seven years. Mr. Speaker, I want our people to be healthy and safe. We want our economy and society to reopen as safely as possible in order to get thousands of Bahamians back to work as quickly and as safely as possible. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of the cur curfew, lockdown, and phased reopening of the economy is to minimize the risk of spread within the economy. At the beginning of the COVID-19 surge in the Bahamas, a lockdown was implemented based on the advice of the health officials. This was done to change the trajectory of COVID-19 cases. The lockdown resulted in a change in the rate of new cases daily. At one point, health officials were expecting as many as 90 cases within a week. But because of the lockdown, there were fewer than expected cases. <laughs> I am also pleased, Mr. Speaker, to report that health officials have been able to contact trace every confirmed case of COVID-19 here in the Bahamas. But I want to remind you that there were two additional cases in Grand Bahama confirmed, and therefore health officials are aggressively pursuing any form of contact with those individuals while one additional case remains equivocal. There's a possibility that we may move from two to 
to treat. <coughs> Contact tracing must be done. Mr. Speaker, even as we are battling COVID-19 on the health front, we developed a plan for the phased reopening of the economy. We put in place unprecedented plans before and in the national budget to address the health, economic, and social aspects of this pandemic. I appointed an economic recovery committee which is preparing bold plans and ideas to help get our economy moving and get more Bahamians back to work. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused the worst downturn and recession in our lifetime. The worst, Mr. Speaker, we have had to gradually open up so that people could try to make a living to take care of themselves and to take care of their families. We have done so while maintaining our core public health message and policies of physical distancing, mask wearing, hand washing, and sanitization. If we remain disciplined with these practices, the Bahamas may remain one of the model nations responding to pandemic. In order to stay ahead of this deadly virus, Mr. Speaker, we are continuing to take necessary preventative measures. Because our borders are now open, there's more risk of importing the virus from overseas. I repeat, our borders are now open, and we run the risk of importing the virus from overseas. But Mr. Speaker, I want to remind them there is a balance, a balanced economy and a balance of life. And we must find that balance. There will be screaming on both sides. There'll be economic screaming, and there'll be la life screaming. But there must be a balance. The reason we must take certain preventative measures, Mr. Speaker, is because we want to avoid problems before they happen, and not just react to them. It's always better to prevent as opposed to reacting. When you're reacting, you're catching up. You're more prone to make mistakes. In terms of prevention, you can plan properly. You can anticipate what may possibly happen and make provisions and plans to deal with what may occur. That is why, Mr. Speaker, beaches and parks are to be closed in New Providence, Arthur Island, Rose Island, Paradise Island, Grand Bamboo, <laughs> and other keys surrounding New Providence over the 10th of July holiday weekend. Jeff, I guess you and I could still go in the ditch. <laughs> Big poem. <laughs> <laughs> they close big pond? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I think I swim now. Mr. Speaker, this is being done out of an abundance of caution. This is being <laughs> This is being <laughs> This is being done, Mr. Speaker, because prevention is better than cure. And during holiday weekends, there is a natural tendency for people to have mass gathering on beaches and parks. Mr. Speaker, I would urge my colleagues <coughs> to review what's happened around the world with respect to beaches and parks and review the possible <coughs> outcome or what have happened in terms of the introduction of virus within those 
facilities and subsequently throughout communities. These are printed throughout the world in all media and I ask that we review the statistics. Mr. Speaker, such mass gatherings are where there can be super spreading of COVID-19. Allow me to repeat, super spreading. These are individuals who are asymptomatic, normal, can be in here, normal, no problem, but they're shedding the virus. Those individuals who had returned from Florida within 72 hours, I understand about 172 of them, they walked into the hotspot and came home. I'm not saying they're infected because we follow protocols and try to adhere as much as possible. <laughs> but should one of them become infected, they can share the virus outside of the incubation period, outside of the 14 days. We say they show symptoms at the 14th day. But during that time, they can share the virus. Third day, fifth day, and infect all of us, yet they're normal. Mr. Speaker, we cannot take this risk. While many Bahamians continue to act responsibly and to observe health measures, there are some who are acting quite irresponsibly and with little to no regard for the health and well-being of others. Hundreds and hundreds of people in close contact with each other but quickly spread this virus, which is very, very easy to catch. And as a government, we want to prevent what Bahamians are seeing on the news every day in countries around the world. There are places where the hospitals are now full the intensive care units are now full. They need more doctors and nurses to help treat all the COVID-19 sick patients. And we all know the first wave internationally, from the first wave internationally, when sick patients overwhelm hospital systems, more people die. The speaker, should we have an outbreak, a surge, our healthcare system can go on a meltdown. The member for Angliston said we can be in trouble, and I agree with her. The member for Angliston, her daughter, is the lead personnel in testing and supplying us with the information for COVID. And our daughter is doing an excellent job, Mr. Speaker, in Vera Martin. What does this mean when we go on a meltdown? It means that you will have no beds for sick patients because your hospital is being utilized by all COVID patients. It means that all elective cases are canceled and you have great difficulty even performing emergency cases. It means, Mr. Speaker, that our routine maternity cases cannot be cared for properly and babies can be born at home or wherever because our hospital is in a meltdown. It also means, Mr. Speaker, that our children, our kids, who need hospitalization for care, there'd be no facility for them. It also means, Mr. Speaker, that your routine cuts and bruises and headaches, you would have no such facilities to be treated. We'd be back to the Stone Ages. But Mr. Speaker, what it also means 
is that doctors are in some parts of the world, I don't want to call specific countries, doctors would then have to make decision that all 80 odd year olds be allowed to die because you're using the beds for the young people. Then you allow the 70 year olds to die. <laughs> then the 60s. Those are decisions that physicians would have to make should we have a meltdown, Mr. Speaker. And therefore, it's essential, it's essential that we make difficult and hard decisions now so as to save so as to save our future. Mr. Speaker, we have not had a meltdown. We've had a limited number of cases and our facilities were used to manage the COVID cases that we've had. But in spite of that, Mr. Speaker, because we were so overwhelmed and dealing with the COVID cases, our immunization numbers had subsequently decreased. What it means is that the percentage rate that we were immunizing our population has now decreased because we were so focused with dealing with COVID. 19. We've not had a meltdown, but our rates have deteriorated. What it means, Mr. Speaker, is that now we are predisposed to a high incidence of mumps. Just from the little that we've had today. So imagine what happens if we have a meltdown. We're at greater risk for measles. We're at greater risk for rubella. And Ms. Speaker, what it also means is because we're at greater risk at rubella, our young people who become pregnant would be at greater risk of having abnormal infants. That's what we have today. And we don't have a meltdown. So do we allow a meltdown to occur, Mr. Speaker? Should it happen, those who visit our shores will no longer visit. Hold it, hold it. Everybody would run. Not only that, mumps, rubella, and measles, and polio that we now would, would now be exposed to because our immunization rates have deteriorated. These must be reported to the World Health Organization. And once they are reported to the World Health Organization, Mr. Speaker, the entire world knows that your immunization rates are not up to what they should be, and you are at risk for mumps, rubella, polio, and others. Individuals would not travel to your country. The speaker, should we allow this to happen in our country, or do we be aggressive? So as we speak today, the health team are meeting and discussing an aggressive plan, utilizing whatever clinics that we have available, an aggressive plan to use social media and other whatever communication source we have to ask our people and our infants to come in so that they can get the necessary immunization because we don't want to go down that road. And we don't have a meltdown. We've only had a number of COVID cases. But our immunization rates have decreased because we were focused on COVID. But if we have a meltdown, oh, Jesus Christ, God help us. God help us. I understand people's disappointment, Mr. Speaker. I understand people's disappointment of not being able to go to the beach on the holiday weekend. And I want to remind them that I was young and would have loved to go on the beach. I'd like to go on the beach, but 
as I said, I had access to the ditch and um, subsequently long war. But I asked the young people today, I asked them, we're only asking you to sacrifice three days. Three days for a healthier and better nation. I'm asking you to sacrifice three days because those three days can save your children should you become pregnant. Would you want an infant to be born blind with cataracts? These are the problems you face, Mr. Speaker, with our immunization rates deteriorating. Would you want your infants to be born blind? You want them to be born with cardiac abnormality, with the heart on the wrong side of the chest. The heart is here. You want your heart here. With abnormal vessels. Three days is all I ask. We got three days. I'm only asking the Bahamian population, do we not wait three days to save a nation? That's all they ask. Three days. Be responsible. If you love yourself, if you love your future generation, if you love your country, and I know the member for Cat Island loves this country. He speaks always of Cat Island especially. He loves his country. <laughs> Angliston speaks all about Angliston. So I ask the entire nation, Mr. Speaker, including our visitors, three days. That's all we ask. Three days to save this little nation. We just had two additional cases. We don't know where they traveled. We don't know. We're investigating them now. Our decisions to speak out for the protection of the humans, residents, and visitors to our shores. We have considered the representations made by our partners in the tourism sector. The decisions taken are being done so soberly. They were done so soberly, Mr. Speaker, and in conjunction with the health advisors to the government. To our visitors, I know that you've come travel to utilize and swim in our beaches. If you love this Bahamas as you say you do, then I ask that you make the sacrifice with us. Mr. Speaker, we are advised by the health professionals. Our health advisors, the health professionals, have been extraordinary. They've been outstanding. And they've been excellent. I say to the Bahamian people, you trusted the health professionals before. You trusted their decision. You trusted them up to this point. You spoke highly of them, both here and internationally. The world recognized them and spoke highly of them. I ask you, if you trusted them before and they brought you this far, 
trust them again. That's all I ask. Keep the faith. Trust them again. They want to go on the beaches too. But they are prepared to sacrifice their time for you. So, again, I repeat. If you trusted the health professionals yesterday, I ask you to help to trust the health professionals today and tomorrow. They have no agenda. Their only agenda, Mr. Speaker, is to save lives and to keep us safe. They don't care about PLP or FNM. They only care about Bahamians. And they care about whoever visit our shores would enter a safe environment. That's their care. That's their training. So I ask the Bahamian people, trust them. And I ask you all to sacrifice three days for the good of our nation. The speaker, I know from long experience that some of the very same people, commentators and institutions, who are criticizing the decision to close certain beaches and parks this coming weekend, would be the very same people criticizing this government if we did not close these beaches and parks resulting in the wider spread oh, of COVID-19. But Mr. Speaker, my conscience is clear and resolved. We are doing the right thing in this case to help prevent the spread of this virus. We do not want, Mr. Speaker, our hospitals and health facility to melt down. We do not want our people to become ill, become sick, or die. And I look at the, I watch the member from Centerville, and I see he's well clad in his mask. <laughs> I can see he's smiling under there. <laughs> and every time I talk about having to live, he shake his head. <laughs> he want to live. Trust the government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we do not want our young people to develop any illness later on in life. I say to the young people, and I want the young people to listen to me very carefully. As they go out, gather, and potentially catch the virus, they take the virus home. Their parents subsequently become infected and they die. Their grandparents would subsequently die. And I know they do not want that on their hands. The speaker, I remind young people that they are not immune to this deadly virus. I remind them that they cause others to get sick and possibly die. And if you love your parents and your grandparents, uncles, you must be disciplined and responsible. We all know, Mr. Speaker, that this virus kills, but what the medical community is learning is there are various serious side effects that may linger. We cannot yet say what all the effects are or when or if they will go away because it is early in the trajectory of this virus. 
There are concerns, Mr. Speaker, COVID-19 causes various types of long-term damage to the bodies of those who survive it. And this, I say especially to the young people, you may survive it today, but let's look at the possible outcome. Let's look at what can happen. We know, we know today that they are high. You can develop what we call gain barrier syndrome, a neurological disorder, somewhat paralysis. We know that that can happen. We also know that they can develop kidney failure, require dialysis. We know that, young people. We also know that they can develop lung failure and subsequently require a transplant. There are cases of that, we know. We also know that it can precipitate diabetes when they had no predisposition. We know that. These are facts. We also know that they can form microclots, little clots, within the blood. We know that. I'm informing the young people what can happen. They're healthy, but we know these things can happen. What we also know, Mr. Speaker, is that during this infection, they can experience what we would call in medicine, viremia. All that means is the virus enters the bloodstream and can spread everywhere. Now, we do not know today what may happen. You may not necessarily present until 10 years later. We don't know because we are still studying this disease. So once it hit the blood, it can go to the brain. So 10 years later, you may come up with dementia. We don't know. So when you imagine an 18 year old today, 28 year old, 10 years later, dementia. We don't know, but we know it goes into the blood and we're studying the process. We also know that when it goes to the blood, a young person may develop stroke. And depending on what part of the brain is affected and the response, other illness, paralysis, etc. Because it goes to the blood, Mr. Speaker, they can also develop what we call, and the member for Elizabeth would know it even better than I do, they can also develop what we call cardiomyopathy. So can you imagine a young man, 18 years a day, who got infected, but he feels strong as ever. And four years, five years from the day he's on the basketball court playing ball, and he drops down dead, bounce, heart attack. Nobody knows, sudden death, bounce. Do you want our people to go through that, Mr. Speaker? These are things the young people must know. We are still studying. We don't know what's gonna happen four or five years from the day, but we do know that we want you to be safe. Then it spreads lung because it's in the blood. It goes to the lung. Lung problems, failure, respiratory problems. Go to the kidney. A young person, 18 today, four years later, kidney failure on dialysis. We also know it goes, once it hits the blood, it goes to the bone, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> no, I, I know, sir, I, I know, St. Anne's want to go on the beach, but I know he don't want to go on the beach now after he finished talking. <laughs> you don't know what I think about that. You don't want to go on the beach, though. I'm going to jump off the rock. Anyhow, the speaker. I'm convinced. I'm convinced. It goes to the bone. 
To the bone marrow. The bone. We know today that it causes, and I won't use medical terms, I'll say basic. It causes a decrease in platelets, a certain element in the blood. But they, with that decrease, you, have, you get spontaneous bleeding. Just bleed. Brush your teeth. Boom. You're bleeding. You're sitting there and talking. Boom. Blood coming out your eye. Blood coming out your skin. We know that the platelets drop. We've not seen that yet. But if the platelet drops, that's a possibility. <laughs> the white blood cells which is responsible, that's your army in the body to protect you. That protects you. As we walk throughout the environment, we are exposed to all sorts of bacteria. But the white blood cells protect us. We know that that level decreases. And therefore, there is a possibility that with the decrease, you must live now in some cocoon and a hip hooded environment because you cannot be exposed to any form of bacteria. So if you think you're locked down now, Jesus Christ, you're locked down in a tent. That's what it's about, Mr. Speaker. And you're worried about a beach. I asked for three days. Three days. When the member for St. Hans changed his mind, he'll give me three days. <laughs> <laughs> change my mind from what? From what? I am led by the health professionals. There you go. There you go. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there are. I can go on and on once you talk about viremia and once you talk about microclots because microclots can obstruct certain vessels and result even in gangrene. You all know about diabetes we have feet no longer receive blood supplies and subsequently drops off or whatever else you want to call it. I can go on and on, but I would be going into, I would be going into my medical field, but I'm only basically telling them, you're healthy today, but we don't know. We're still studying, but we know certain things. And I told you the things that we know. We are working as a government, Mr. Speaker, and health team to do all we can to prevent this dangerous virus from spreading. Mr. Speaker, PLP would have been a disaster <laughs> during, during the COVID-19. I didn't call your name. I did not call your name. I, I did not call your name. <laughs> in fact, you like a double-minded. You can recognize the honorable member for Cat Island, Ram Key, and San Salvador. The this, as I understand it, is a communication. No, no, no. no just a communication. We get resolution. Members, correct. It, this is. Um, statement and communication. Yeah, that's, yeah, so it, it should it, not be provocative. I agree. And, 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 and it ought not to be right. laced with broadsides right. on, on, or controversial. And I would I invite you, Mr. Speaker, to so um, chastise and correct the Prime Minister. You're not in charge. No, sorry, sorry, the member for Kalani. You're in charge. And, and, and likewise, <laughs> to ensure that he withdraws those, those uh, Boston. Remarks that are controversial and laced with political <laughs> broadsides. Yeah. I accept what the members say, communication. And therefore, Speaker, I can wrap up my communication now 
because the next 10 minutes I'm going to slap up the member. And therefore, I would leave that until I reach the resolution. So, Mr. Speaker, I complete my communication. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, 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 order that the communication, order that the communication be brought up. The portion that you finished. Order that the communication do lie on the table. Further statements and communications by ministers. Uh, the chair recognizes the honourable member for Sandville on a point of order. Yes, this one a, uh, a, a clarification. Yeah, clarification on. Clarification. Clarification. Thank you. As uh, uh, the member for Sandville indicated that uh, beaches and parks are closed. I can't hear the honourable member. Please raise your microphone and speak up, please. Yeah, the member, the member indicated that beaches and parks will be closed uh, this weekend, and I just wanted to know if that includes uh, private beaches and private parks. Uh, Okay, well, the, 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 the chair recognizes again the member for Sandoval. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are there are some gated communities as well as homes that are on beaches. And so I'm just I'm just asking if all beaches, which means which means if they would include private beaches as well as public people and private parks may be parks within the gated communities or public parks i just need clarification because i and i know why i'm asking oh, honorable members um there, there being no further st uh, statements and communication by ministers we'll move on it's still not clear to me I'm just asking, do you mean all beaches and all parks? Thank you. <laughs> communications, communications by the clerk. Messages from the Governor General. Messages from the Senate. Motions for leave of absence, leave to resign, seat, and new writ. Presentation of petitions. Presentations of reports of committees. Adoption of reports of committees. First reading of bills. Second reading and committal of bills. <laughs> Committee of the whole. Third reading and passing of bills. Consideration of Senate amendments. Resolutions. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Kalani. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> now, Grace. <laughs> Grace yourself, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move the following resolution. Whereas, pursuant to Article 29 1 of the Constitution, the Governor General may make a proclamation of emergency declaring that state of public emergency for the purposes of that article exists in the Bahamas. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this House, <coughs> A, approves the continuance of the proclamation made on the 29th day of June, 2020, until the 31st day of June, of July, 2020. B, affirms the continuance in effect of the emergency powers COVID-19 pandemic regulation 2020, made on the 29th day of June, 2020, until the 31st day of July, 2020. C, 
Committee affirms the continuance in effect of the Emergency Powers COVID-19 pandemic order 2020 made on the 30th day of June 2020 until the 31st day of July 2020. And D affirms the continuance and effect of the Emergency Powers COVID-19 Pandemic Special Provisions Order 2020 made on the 30th day of June 2020 until the 31st day of July 2020. Mrs. Speaker, as I, as I commence my debate, reaffirm by state the PLP would have been a disaster during the COVID-19. In fact, they are a disaster during this pandemic, even while in opposition. As reported in the Tribune yesterday, the leader of the opposition seemed to suggest that the decision to close certain beaches this holiday weekend appeared arbitrary and devoid of a scientific basis. He is wrong on both fronts. The decision was carefully and strategically taken based on medical science and based on what we have seen in other jurisdictions and the potential for super spreading of COVID-19 during this upcoming holiday weekend. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we can, on, we can only look across our borders and see what is happening in Florida, what is happening in Texas, and even Arizona. And I would say, unlike them, we want to protect our people. This leads me to believe, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> that were he in position to do so, he would allow these beaches and parks to remain open, possibly endangering the health and lives of Bahamian people. And sadly, tragically, the leader of the opposition continues to demonstrate an arbitrary, reckless, irresponsible, and unscientific posture to the threat of COVID-19. He can't seem to make up his mind, Mr. Speaker, whether the country is opening too quickly or not quickly enough. His pronouncements and posture seem to be based on putting his finger in the wind. <laughs> and depending on how the wind blow it, that's the decision. What? If the wind blow it up, it's a decision. If it blows down, it's a decision. It goes in the direction of that little wind. Oh, As for me and my government, Mr. Speaker, our decisions are based on medical science and medical facts. And the need to balance the health, social, and economic needs of the Bahamian people. This is a time for responsible, <coughs> strong, and steady leadership, not pandering and posturing like the leader of the opposition. I say again, he and his party would have been a disaster during this time, an absolute and unmitigated disaster. Oh. Mr. Speaker, we must remain a cautious and disciplined people. We must maintain physical distancing, and we must keep wearing our mask. Senator, what about the uh, mask? Uh, <laughs> 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 Mr. Speaker, we must keep wearing our mask. We must wash and sanitize our hands and we should stay away from crowds. We must stay ahead of the virus, Mr. Speaker, and never allow it to get in front of us. If it gets in front of us, 
we know the problems we face. And our tourist industry will crash. Not only because of the virus, because also of reporting the WHO in terms of our immunization status. We must protect the more vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas will press onward so that we can continue to move into a time of hope triumph and transformation, which is the theme for this year's independence celebration. Thank you, Fort Charlotte. I invite the Bayman people, Mr. Speaker, to watch the virtual independence celebration, which begins at 8 p.m. tomorrow night on July 19th, July 9th on ZNS. And Mr. Speaker, in response to the unprecedented last 10 months following Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic, we have taken unprecedented action as a nation. And because of our actions and our Bahamian spirit, we will rise, Mr. Speaker. And as a phoenix, we will rise. The world continues to mark the manner of our bearing, but we must continue to do what is right so that the world can continue to see and to respect our bright banners waving high. We are, Mr. Speaker, resilient people. The essence of resilience is discipline. It's fortitude and it's determination. We cannot slack off. No. We cannot rest. We cannot go weak because the virus is as aggressive and as deadly as ever. While we rest, if we rest, the virus will never rest. It will continue to traverse societies. Let us not put our shared sacrifices and the sacrifices of our healthcare professionals at risk. Let us remain alert, vigilant, and strong. May God bless our Bahamas as we celebrate May God bless our Bahamas as we celebrate 47 years of a sovereign, proud, free, and resilient people. I wish the members of the House and the Bahamian people a happy and safe independence. Mr. Speaker, many people have asked, why do we lock down 10 p.m.? 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. And we asked for an extension. The question is asked why. The speaker, we believe, we believe that during those times, the mass gathering, parties, etc. That's most active times to our view. There's no scientific evidence at this point in time. And nobody would know until five, ten years from the day when they look back and they analyze how the Bahamas manage, how the U.S. manage, how the U.K. manage. That's when the results would come out. Because today, we're all fluid. We're changing. But we're getting results. What they may find out that in other countries, their mass gathering may be at different times, and that would be appropriate for them, but not necessarily for us. But we won't know that today. But we feel, and I tried to 
obtain such information from the statistics department. They don't have such information. The police offered some, but that's not sufficient. But nobody can answer that question until five, ten years from the day as we review how the various countries managed the COVID-19. But we feel 10 to 5 is the most active period within our setting. And that is demonstrated by Waterloo. That is demonstrated by the restaurants in the East, the restaurants in the West. Young people don't party before 8 o'clock. You know, Mr. Speaker, when I was in university, I would go to bed, I would go to bed at 8 o'clock, and then I get up at 11.30 because I'm not going to party until 12. I'm certain the young people do that today. That's the most active time. That was my most active time. So at 12 o'clock when I'm at the party and boogieing, they say, where he got all this energy from? Not knowing that I just woke up. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, we believe that the 10 to 5 is the most active time, busy time, gathering. And therefore, we warn people about gathering. Gathering can be dangerous. We have in the order where we limit that. I know the police just recently closed down some place because there were 150 individuals. All you needed was one. One infection can cause a meltdown of an entire country. One. And then you know what they're going to say? Minister managed it bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> I get blamed because of him. That's what they're waiting for. I'm home in my bed sleeping. <laughs> it's bigger. So that's the reason. That's the reason. But nobody, nobody can say whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong. Not today. But they can say that. Ten years from today. Everything is fluid. But what we have done it's working. It's working. So 10 to 5. It's probably working. It's probably the best. And other countries need to look at their most active periods and devise their formula around their most active periods. The speaker. There will be a lot of talks about young doctors that just finished. I could say that the young doctors, I think 35 of them, they had had their interviews and whatever else for their matching. And I can say that all 35 has been matched. So they would be employed. They've, they've been matched. I'm talking about doctors right now. They've been matched. <laughs> then, then, Mr. Speaker, They'll also ask about the house officers as you move from intern to house officers. They are being assessed or determined at this time in terms of the employment. Princess Margaret has so much. Sandman's has so much. Um, public health has so much. So they're going through that process at mm -hmm. this particular time. So whatever questions you may have, I'll be able to answer after they go through the process. But I, they would be engaged. But I have more information, but this is not the time. Sometimes you throw fire bun, somebody catch it, then spike them. Anyhow, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I so move this resolution. <laughs> Thank you. Is, is the second did you recognize this, the Honorable Member? Did you recognize the Honorable Member for Yamacraw? 
I got the check here again. I got the check here again. Thank you. 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 Thank you.